in the way was built because into the Intermoons administration deemed it necessary to showcase the architecture of the residences back in the day. Exactly as they would have been you know, built, exactly as they would have appeared during the late 1800s. So, in that sense, the Mandi done a very good job here. We know this complex more for Parbayas, that heirloom has done that at least we've eaten there at least once during probably a... Two of the more popular stories are as follows. On the living room area, which is this corridor over here, people claim to see the ghost of a tall European man wearing a top hat and a dark suit. The locals of Intamoros have named this fearsome ghost, the man with the hat. Apparently, si Dr. Seuss ang nagbigay ng pangalan. I'm not, I'm not inventing this, okay? <laughs> on the kitchen area, people claim to see the silhouette of a person jumping off the roof, okay? Like flying past the window. And they would hear the splat as if that person fell on the pavement. But upon checking the pavement, usually they won't see anything anymore. So those are the two more popular ones, aside from the usual banging um, banging footsteps, uh, moaning, groaning, change, all of that. Aside from those, those are the most um, notable manifestations. Now, here's the thing. I'm very sure it's not true. Why? When was the last time you've seen a three-story bahay na bato? Answer, you haven't. There's no such thing as a three-story residential house. The best you will do is if your house has a mezzanine, so it's a half floor. The mezzanine usually has the rooms the extra bedrooms for the spinster uncles and aunties, or it has the office of the owner of the house, or both, okay? But it's a half floor, it's not a full on second floor. This was just built that the second floor was fully realized, okay? And some people like to delude themselves, it's amazing, it's not. It's a second floor, so yeah, that's the confusion there. So if there was no third floor at the time, where did the ghosts come from? the roof. It's so weird. And that's another example of when you think, if, you th if you're hoping you're going to see a ghost somewhere, if you really believe you're going to see a ghost, your brain will give it to you. Your brain will show it to you. And you will connect things in a such a way that even if it wasn't the case, you think, you will believe that you did. Case in point, the number one man, the number one ghost sighting, with oh, quotation marks, huh? Ghost sighting in Intermoros are people claiming to see the ghost of gorgeous Sibyl walking around the premises. Well, newsflash, what are the secu actual security guards wearing? Gorgeous Sibyl uniforms. <laughs> so, hello. <laughs> ano ba yan? Another, another example. In the Manila Central Post, people who visit the Manila Central Post office often claim that they see the ghost of male men walking around the premises. Makes sense, right? Post office, male men. Until you start asking them, okay, what did the uniforms look like? And then they stop. And then they're confused. Because they then realize they don't know what the uniforms of the past look like. So they start describing something totally wrong and totally off base. Because they, they didn't actually see anything. They just thought they did. And that's how your mind can play tricks on you. Amazon University. For now, I want to talk about another story from the 1600s, aka what the heck were they doing that century? The story involves another governor general, his wife, and his wife's lover. Wait, there are no kids in the group today? Hindi included ng kid at heart, ha? Okay, nobody below, nobody below 18? Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so the year is 1618. The, what do you call this? The governor general in question is Alfonso Fajardo, who was the governor general of the Philippines from 1618 to 1624, where he died in office. Okay, now, around the time that he assumed the position, he suspected that his wife, Catherine Zambreno, was having an affair with a Spanish businessman by the name of Juan Mesa who happened to live in a mansion exactly we, where we are standing right or sitting right now. So, to prove his suspicions, one day he goes up to Catherine and tells Catherine, Catherine, I have to go to Cavite to conduct some business. Now, back then, 
going to Cavite was a long and arduous affair. Okay, it was very exhausting and time consuming. And I hope none of you are going to look at me and say, hanggang ngayon pa naman po. Wala naman po na bago. But there is a lot of things have changed. Because nowadays you can ride your car, you can drive to Cavite, you can hit Bacoor, you will be stuck there for two hours, you will be cursing the traffic. But at least you're there already. Back in the Spanish period, you would ride the, you would ride the Calesa. It doesn't matter how many horses you go because four horses does not mean four horsepower. It doesn't work that way. Okay, it will take you half a day to get there. You'll need to rest. You probably are going to stay the night over there before you come back. So long story short, it will take you too way too long to get to Cavite, which is what Catherine was probably counting on. And that is also what Alfonso was counting on because he did not go to Cavite. 30 minutes upon leaving the house, he turns around and goes back home. And surprise, surprise, Catherine is gone. She couldn't wait. When Alfonso asked her, you know, his servants where did his wife go, all of them pointed to this general direction. So now Alfonso has his proof that his wife was having extramarital affairs with another person. Normally, the Governor General will tell the Sargento Mayor to send a group of soldiers to go to the house to arrest both Alpujano, to arrest both Juan Mesa and Captain Zembeno. That is the proper way of doing things. Of course, that's exactly what Alfonso Fajardo did not do. Police forces who were still holding on to Manila Quite foolishly, if I may, to, if I were to add, um, 16,000 Japanese soldiers were going to come up against a contingent of thank you, a contingent of American soldiers over 35,000 you know, men strong, also armed to the teeth. On paper, the soldiers, you know, the Japanese had no chance against the Americans, and the Americans knew it. The first few days of the battle went, to, you know, went exactly as the Americans thought it would. Quickly, swiftly, decisively. Key locations and key districts fell into American hands uh, quite easily, including the University of Santo Tomas, which was being used by the Japanese as a concentration camp for foreigners. It was that particular location that the Americans were more than eager to rescue from the Japanese because they were fearful for the 4,000 4, remaining people there. If only they waited a little bit longer. General Douglas MacArthur was so encouraged by what he saw that he prematurely announced to the rest of the world that Manila has already fallen back into American hands. Three days afterwards, which was, for lack of a better term, um, <laughs> stupid, because the battle actually lasted way longer than that. So for the next two weeks after those initial three days, the battle slowed down to a crawl. The Japanese um, played every single guerrilla trick that they could play. They hid in the buildings. They tore down the streets. They put booby tubs. They demolished the, you know, the bridges. They burned down entire villages just to cover their tracks and just to hide. And because of that, the Americans and the Japanese started to fight very, very slowly. Certain areas, they were be, we, they would be fighting house per house or street per street. Okay. So welcome to the Parian Park, okay? Now, if this were the Spanish period, you'd actually be outside of Intramuros at this point in time because you're already outside of the gate. The structure, uh, the structure here is the Puerta del Parian. This was the most important gate of Intramuros. Well, not, maybe important is a little, a little bit too much. It definitely was the busiest gate of Intramuros as this was the gate that connected Intramuros to the outside world. Okay, so most of the, no, so this was the gate that the residents of Intramuros would use to access the outer towns or the so-called extramuros. 
So, if you wanted to go to Malate or Ermita or Paco or Quiapo and Binondo, this was the gate that was closest to those towns. So, because of that, there was a steady stream of people going in and out of the walled city through this gate. Now, the gate, you know, the gate and the, the gate, the Revelin and the walls of the section were heavily damaged during the Battle of Manila. So much so that for the longest time after the battle up to 1981, there were no walls in this section. Most of the walls you're seeing in this part of Intermuros was rebuilt in 1981. Okay, so during 1981, they also started cleaning up this area to form the park that you're now seeing. So this is known, um, this is known as Pahean Park. It is also called the ASEAN Gardens. Okay, so that's what all these busts are for. That's why there's a lot of Southeast Asian flags in there. Okay, so here's the thing. Back in 1981, when they were clearing this out, I know, when they were clearing this out, especially this area, eh? can you point to that er the general area? Okay, um, shift the lights, please. When they were clearing out that particular area, they started finding skeletons. And then they found more skeletons. And then more of them. Until... They found an entire grave there. Because I'm kind of a sandal. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll miss you. Anyway, <laughs> yan. Yan ang nakita nila yan. Ayan. Thank you very much. Okay. So with that, the you know, the construction in this area the you know, gains to a halt, and the National Museum swoops in and starts an archaeological dig. And guess what? They found more. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mass graves of Intramuros. And that was literally what this area was after 1945. This was a demarcated mass grave area of Intramuros. As proof of that, this is a photo taken in 1986 of the general area there, okay? What do you see in front of the picture? White crosses. So this was not a random people died here, tinambakan at kainiwan. This was actually a dedicated mass grave zone so let so i'm going to explain what this area was all about so let me paint the picture here remember those photos i showed you before we went here right the states the streets of manila were covered in dead bodies and because those bodies were exposed in the air the bottle the bodies were starting to decompose exposed to everyone so that decomposition times how many dead god knows how many dead bodies were all around there meant that if the authorities did not hurry up with their clean-up operations, Manila would be subject to an epidemic. But here's the problem. Most of the hospitals and morgues were blown into smithereens during the Battle of Manila. So processing the dead bodies became a problem. So as a stopgap solution, the city, you know, the city demarcated a lot of areas to serve as mass graves. They were meant to be temporary because the moment that... Uh, the moment that the bodies can be processed, the bodies were to be exhumed and processed accordingly before being buried somewhere more proper. Where theory is, they probably exhumed some of the bodies here, but they forgot a total of 130 bodies divided across four graves. The bodies found here were of Japanese soldiers. The bodies found in the outskirts were of civilians. Of course, the discovery of the mass graves was quite a sensation even during the period of martial law where most news was curtailed. But the discovery of the mass graves of Intramuros, 35 years after the fact, um, leads to a more bothersome question. If you were able to find mass graves 35 years afterwards, how sure are you that you found all of the mass graves? Because let me paint the picture. Can I have the flashlight? Thank you. Anyway, no, no. Um, so the general area surrounding this, okay. So this one is a manicured park. Most of Intramuros is actually covered, you know, surrounded by a golf course, which in itself is already bothersome because that's an acres and one acres of land that you're not sure if they double checked or not. But aside from the golf course, there's also a lot of pockets of undeveloped land still outside of Intramuros, totally untouched. So. Dun palang, you're not sure if there are this anything there to find or not. Also, what did we see when we were walking through the middle of Intramuros? You saw factories and warehouses and parking lots for trucks and schools and libraries and museums. 
most of which were built in a breakneck, breakneck speed over a 10-year span. Most of those buildings that you saw now were built rather fast between 1950 to 1960. It was almost as if the people, the business people building them were in a hurry to build them. They were probably in a hurry to build them because they were so paranoid that something that they might find something there that might you know that might prevent them from building their building of verses covered in blood running down up and down the corridors now ordinarily if you said students or teachers covered in blood i would say yeah of course you'd say that it's a school eh? so diba uso uso gumawa ng mga kwento tungkol sa mga students and ka teachers but nurses is tantalizingly unique why nurses why nurses specifically okay now we do know that there was a nursing course in Lyceum of the Philippines but I don't think the course was that hard naman but the real answer is that one because before this was Lyceum this was the San Juan de Dios Hospital Mm. San Juan de Dios Hospital is the oldest hospital in the Philippines. It was, firm, it was founded in this location and remained there until 1945. After the war, it transferred to the Hospital Boulevard beside the Department of Foreign Affairs building. <coughs> so yes, this building existed here in 1945. Yes, it was a massacre site. As dozens of uh, patients and doctors and nurses were massacred by the Japanese, before the survivors were herded out of this hospital and brought to the ruins of the Santo Domingo Church. Afterwards, when the Americans started the bombardment of Intramuros, the hospital was one of the first structures to be destroyed. So now that you know that this used to be a hospital, the story of ghostly nurses running up and down the corridors makes a bit more sense. With that, now we're going to lay it on. Now we're going to let down that the walls were took around 10 to 15 years to complete. The walls are 20 to 22 feet in height and on an average they are 8 to 10 feet wide. If you if it were still possible to walk across the whole walls nowadays it would be approximately 4.7 kilometers in distance. That is the equivalent of walking from Intramuros back to Makati. I mean it's doable but you're not going to enjoy it. <coughs> Especially on the super highway. Anyway, the walls of Intermos are made out of a stone called adobe. Now, adobe is a good dependable igneous rock that is in plentiful supply in Bulacan and Pampanga, but most notably in Guadalupe, Makati. So most of the stones used to build Intermos and the churches and the structures were actually quarried from Guadalupe. <coughs> okay. Anyway. This building has had multiple identities throughout its lifespan. Okay, now during the American period, this was also consequently um, consist, consist, eh, take two. During the American period, this was also known as the Intendencia, and it was a mixed-use building used by both the private and the public sector. After the Battle of Manila, this building became the Central Bank of the Philippines. It then took on many roles up to 1979. Um, when it burned down, the last um, the last office to occupy it was the Commission of Elections. Tapos sa sunog. And uh, alam niyo na. Anyway, once this building is restored, this is going to be the headquarters of the National Archives. They are the agency paying for the restoration. But the most important iteration of this building was during the Spanish period when this was the aduana or the customs house. Uh, this is not a tour for this one, but I would be remiss to not to mention that the history of Manila is closely tied to trade and commerce. Manila has been an important settlement even before the Spaniards arrived because of its proximity to Manila Bay and Pasig River, making this an excellent trading post. Okay, And then when the Spaniards came here, they turned Manila into the terminus point of the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade which totally redefined world trade and the world economy for the next 200 years. Because of that, Manila, along with Acapulco and Madrid, were the first global cities ever. Ever. A and the BIR and the BF, Kondo. The most popular story is people claim to hear the laughter of children 
inside the ruins of the aduana. As if these children were running around playing tag. Sometimes, back when this you know, fence was not installed here, people claimed to see floating lights inside the aduana, as if somebody walking with a candle or a torch. I have had the opportunity to tour one of the architects currently working on this project. And what she told me was so weird. <clears throat> According to her, the first time their firm, Arclico, um, the first time their, uh, no, their firm entered the aduana, they got lost. As in, they could not find the way out. In Tagalog, nililigaw sila. I did not bother to ask that architect if she did the shirt thing because, well, number one, she was female and that sounds really inappropriate. But whatever it is, there are a lot of shenanigans and weird you know, phenomena attached to the aduana. Now, according to one of the other psychics that I was walking around in, the aduana is acting like some sort of net or catchment. Because behind the aduana is already the Pasig River. As in literally, aduana, street, water. Okay. Sigur. Just wait for that lovely couple to rise from the ashes. The Manila Cathedral is the same because this church has been destroyed six, seven times in the past only to be rebuilt over and over and over again. The first Manila Cathedral was burned down in a fire in what is possibly the most tragically funny story I can ever tell. Now, mind you, the words tragic and funny should never be used in the same sentence but you will agree with me in this case it fits. So as the story goes, back in 1584, there was a funeral procession at the San Agustin Church, which at the time was made out of wood. So according to the story, an altar boy, an altar boy tripped, he dropped his candle, and the candle fell on the carpet of the San Agustin catching fire. The fire then spread to the entire church, burning it down. Sparks and embers from that fire spread to the outlaying houses, which were also made out of wood. So, one by one, the houses of Manila started burning down until it reached the Manila Cathedral, which was also made out of wood at that time. So, while, so once the fire reached the Manila Cathedral, the newly minted cathedral burned to a crisp. I hope, for the sake of the boy, that he died in the fire. Because can you imagine if he survived? Today, it's our turn to slap you. The second, the third, the fourth, the 5th and the 6th Manila Cathedrals were destroyed by earthquakes. The 7th Manila Cathedral, along with everything that you're seeing here, except for that one, except for that, was destroyed during the Battle of Manila. The church was, for a while, there was discussion that the Manila Cathedral was going to be transferred somewhere else. Eventually, they decided to keep it inside in Tamoyo. So the church was actually rebuilt as recently as 1958. The structure is only 65 years old. So you would, okay, so because of the history, accumulated history of the general area, the Manila Cathedral has seen so many deaths, so much violence throughout its history, whether inside the cathedral or outside it. Just to add to that path, just to add one more story of violence here. The ruins, so this area is the Palacio de Gobernador. This was ruined for the longest time until 1975. Okay? So this building you're looking at was only completed in 1975. Back then, it was ruined since 1863. So, during the Japanese occupation, um, people built an air raid shelter inside, no, within the ruins. So within those ruins, during the actual Battle of Manila, Japanese soldiers heard that shoved in a total of 160 men inside those air raid shelters. Then they dropped grenades inside those chambers, killing most of the people inside. Most because there were like four survivors, one of which was a Franciscan priest who then managed to crawl all the way from there to what we now call Vapua University because that's where the Franciscan churches were. Only to find that the churches were destroyed by the American bombardment. 
I'm sorry, I forgot to explain. I forgot the uh, detail. The Franciscan priest was crawling while holding onto his stomach because this was split open and his innards were spilling out. Just leading more credence to the saying, if it's not your time to die, you're not going to die. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the, Jor no, the Georgian consulate, Christmas is still alive. <laughs> anyway, at this point, please follow Rain inside Fort Santiago. Um, you may take the opportunity to go to the bathroom or buy more refreshments. I will be purchasing our ticket. Okay, so this is basically the Prince of Manila 101. Kasama ng Manila Cathedral and Joysal Monument and City Hall. Diba? Yan pag ginugal for Chiang Manila, boom! Ayan. So again, again. So the photo I'm showing you was taken back in 2018. This was during the preparations for the um, Manila Biennale of Carlos Saldan and other partners, of which I was also part of, actually. So anyway, the photo, okay. So the photo, the person in the photo, does the, her, her identity doesn't really matter to the full story. I will tell her, I, I will tell her name anyway, because, oh my God, I still find it so cool that I'm her friend. Um, her name is Yvette Tan. She is one of the best horror writers in the Philippines. Her two, no, ano, her two anthologies, Waking the Dead and Seek Ye Horror, um, are some of the best horror anthologies you're ever going to read. For some reason, she also used to be the agriculture edit, um, uh, editor of the agriculture section of Manila Bulletin because of them connected. Dun. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, now, one thing that you should know about Yvette is that um, she is, in Filipino terms, lapitin. Okay, and that is my warning for those who are going to try what was tried dito. So the person who took the photo was one of the psychics that I was walking around in Tamuros with. She wanted to play an experiment, okay? So she told the event, stand here, I'll take your photo, and then as soon as I take your photo, please step away as, as quickly as you can. The next photo was taken two seconds afterwards. So, anong nakikita nyo sa gitna? Orbs. And it's not just one orb, it is a cluster. Okay, some of you are thinking, orbs, that's just bulk, and there's just, you're taking a picture of the lights, so of course there may light flares dyan. And for those of you who thought this, okay, sorry, hindi, awa naman ako sa likod. Dami nyo eh. Ay! Nagiklang. For those who are ano, thinking that there's looks are just bulk eh, or light flares, because ka naman, you are taking a photo straight onto the light. That's a good theory, very good theory, and I applaud you for being critical. However, if it was bokeh or lighters, where was it in the first photo? Remember, both photos were taken two seconds apart. Light flares don't disappear just like that. If you took one photo, if light, it is of light flares, they should be present on both photos. What happened here? When Yvette stood here, she was approached, and the camera caught him. Okay, this is probably not going to work if you are not what we call lapidin, okay? And if you are, I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, with that, let's help. You're now standing in front of the infamous dungeon of Fort Santiago. The dungeon was first built in back in 1599, but it wasn't supposed to, originally it wasn't supposed to be a dungeon. It was supposed to be a storage facility for games and animation. The problem with that is, um, and again, remember what I said about adobe. Adobe absorbs liquids like a sponge. Right now, be, you know, just behind the walls, it's literally, you know, that's literally the Pasig River already. So the Pasig River is right beside the dungeon. Because of that, there is a constant source of liquid beside the structure, which means the structure at the time was always wet and moist. Actually, something's never changed. If it just rains strong enough, this this chamber will flood. Now, imagine back then. So the Spaniards just transferred the storage facility somewhere else, somewhere more above ground, and they converted this this to a dungeon. And of course, they used it. 
But we're not here to talk about what the Spanish did. We're here to talk about what the Japanese did. Because the Japanese used this as a storage facility. Right, sorry. Used this as a, ano, as a prison cell for prisoners of war. The problem with that statement is you assume that they actually threw in very dangerous prisoners here. Quite the opposite. Because if the Japanese considered you to be actually dangerous, they would kill you on site. Okay, if you're a guerrilla or a rebel or a general troublemaker or dissident, they'll just kill you. No wasting facility. There's no wasting resources on you. So the people who actually get thrown into this prison are those who commit minor crimes and misdemeanors, among other things. Okay, as minor as jaywalking. Americans broke open the lock of the dungeon back, you know, during the latter stages of the Battle of Manila. They found 600 bodies inside the dungeon. Now that in itself is shocking, but at which point um, there's already a level of desensitization happening. Because if you start seeing dead bodies all around you, you start getting used to it. However, the, 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 the condition of the bodies inside the dungeon surprised and then bothered the Americans. Okay, because number one. There were no marks of death on the bodies. There were no gunshots, no stab wounds, no decapitation, strangulation, disembowelment, burning, or anything to suggest that bodily harm was done on the prisoners. Number two, the, you know, the bodies were not decomposing at the same rate. There were bodies that were more decomposed than others. So the reason for the number two, you know, the reason for the decomposition rate is because the the prisoners did not die at the same time. And the prisoners did not have any marks on their bodies because they were not killed, they died. And that's a big difference. So, what happened? As far as we can tell, during the first week of the Battle of Manila, those, the Japanese who were guarding the dungeon, abandoned their post. Whether they you know, whether maliciously or otherwise, it doesn't matter at this point. What matters was they left their post. The 600 P you know, prisoners already inside the dungeon were left to die of starvation. Before any of you think that that's a far better option than dying because you were you know you were killed, guess again. That had to be more horrible because of the conditions surrounding them. At least if you were part of a massacre, they would have shot you, they would have stabbed you in the neck or cut your head off, but it would have been done quickly. A point of, a point of fear, a flash of pain, and then it's all over. Those who died in the dungeon had to wait for death. Surrounded by 599 all people who were also waiting for death. Unwillingly. So there would have been screaming, there would have been kicking, there would have been gnashing of teeth. You could not even believe the amount of depression and sadness and fear and anger inside that area. And no matter how hard the prisoners here would scream for people, for anybody to rescue them, their screams will be unheard because surrounding them were bombardments and destruction all around them. The sounds of buildings being blasted apart. The sounds of screams on the other side of the river. The sounds of the Japanese running around here and there, not giving a damn about what happens to them. The scent of death, the scent of burning flesh all across them. Meanwhile, those inside the dungeon will, be start, will start to die one by one. Eventually, the smell of fecal matter and decomposing bodies surrounds them. And eventually, 600 becomes 300, becomes 100, becomes 50, becomes a handful. The hardiest, strongest of them all will probably last for 10 days, given the situation, given their condition. Okay? I cannot believe any of them will last two weeks in that situation. The Americans only arrived to liberate Fort Santiago on February 23, 1945. That is week four. So by the time they broke open the lock of the dungeon, there were no survivors. For which I am thankful for. I cannot even begin to imagine the mental and emotional state of anybody who survives that. The loans are the a handful of survivors, somebody who survives being surrounded by dead bodies all across them. While, every, while hell on earth was happening, they would have lost their minds. So in this case, death would have come as a friend, merciful. It is to the reason that the dungeon is considered holy sacred ground because 
of the experiences of those who died during the Battle of Manila. But at the same time, that is also why the dungeon is considered to be the most haunted spot of all of Intramuros. And you just walk past it. The name would suggest this was the living quarters of the American soldiers assigned to Intramuros during the American period. There is no other historical significance whatsoever to that building. However, it is still deemed important because it is the only ruins inside within Metro Manila that has the marks of war. That building was destroyed during the Battle of Manila and thus every single piece of damage you can see there is due to the battle. And that's what makes it special. 1930s. So you're now looking at the Manila Central Post Office. Yes, ma'am, the, the building in the middle is a post office meant for sending and receiving mail. Never mind if it's huge and would have looked like a capital building ordinarily. And please take note of the white manicure, the white avenues, the clean area. Even beyond in the back looks like it's been scrubbed. You know how it is. And the back of the Manila Cathedral is the also equally iconic Jones Bridge, a beautiful new classical bridge that connects both sides of Manila together. Okay. Now back in the day, the term you know, the term Pearl of the Orient was coined for Manila, not for the Philippines. Nowadays, it stands for the entire country. But back in the day, the Pearl of the Orient was Manila. Manila was also called the Paris of the East or the Paris of Asia. And when you see photos like this, you can like, yeah, yeah I can see it. Okay, if I told you this photo was taken in San Francisco, you would believe me, right? It does look very San Francisco, right? But this was, in fact, not San Francisco. It is Santa Cruz, Manila. <laughs> and not the Santa Cruz that, you know, you see on those t-shirts nowadays. I don't even know what that is. It's Santa Cruz, I think, okay? So, leading to Quiapo, that part of Santa Cruz. This is just off Escolta. The Santa Cruz Church is on the... It's just off camera here. And yes, we did have 10 vias. And yes, you can see a lot of Filipinos wearing three pieces because that was in fashion during the American era. Never mind if this is a tropical country with no air conditioning at the time. In Tagalog, Tas Ginda. Tis Ganda, Tis Ganda, hindi Tas Ganda. This is a street in Binondo known as Escolta. And Escolta, uh, during the time of the Americans, was our version of Wall Street. It was our version of Main Avenue. This was the preferred address of major businesses that were found, you know, that were, you know, that were active in the Philippines. Because of that, that was the excuse a lot of Filipino and American architects needed to build some of the biggest, most beautiful buildings ever. Some of which are still standing in the street today. Because of that, a lot of large banks built huge headquarters near Escolta, such as HSBC, such as Standard Charter, such as the First Bank of New York, such as China Bank, and more. And there are actually more to that, okay? And the reason that they did that was because there was so much money to be made in Manila. Now, Manila was, it wasn't just a repository of beautiful buildings. At the time of the Americans, Manila was a city on the up and up. It, the Americans built on Manila's importance as a trading post and as a source of business. But more importantly, they also established new industries and businesses within the country, something the Spaniards never did. And because of that, Manila was enjoying a wave of prosperity for quite unseen in this country for a long, long time. And truthfully, Manila was one of the best cities of Asia at the time. Until it wasn't. To be fair, Americans did not bomb um, did not bomb Manila during the Battle of Manila. They bombed Manila before the Battle of Manila. Presented without context. An American Sherman tank barging into the, you know, the entrance of the iconic Fort Santiago. Like nothing. This is what Intramuros looked like after the war. Everything totally decimated except for a structure on the top right. San Agustin. And the San Agustin Church survived out of plain dumb luck. <coughs> it got lucky. It was not spared. The Americans just didn't hit it hard enough. 
These are the ruins of two of the uh, two of the seven churches of Intomus. Because yes, Intomus before 1941 had seven churches, six universities, two high schools, three hospitals, the seat of power, the Supreme Court, this fortress, and the homes of the Spanish elite in an area comparable to Disneyland. So these were two of those churches. This is the San Nicolas de Tolentino Church on the forefront, which is now the Manila Bulletin. And the bound in the back is the Lady of Lourdes, which is now Ilustrado Hesterhan. The San Nicolas de Tolentino was the very church Alfonso Fajardo had the bodies of his wife, his wife's lover, and his wife's lover's servant strung up for two weeks. The, uh, the San Nicolas de Tolentino was also the second home of the Black Nazarene. In fact, the Black Nazarene that we now venerate is a copy. The original Black Nazarene was inside San Nicolas when it got destroyed. So what we're now venerating is a copy not the original, because of the Battle of Manila. This is the ruins of the Coleo de San Juan de Latan, the oldest school still functioning inside Manila. The rubble in front of it are, are the, you know, the very walls of Intramuros, destroyed by the American bombardment. Last photo. This is the San Agustin Church, the sole survivor of the Battle of Manila, standing in the middle of nowhere standing in what looks like a wasteland. And that wasteland is Intramuros. Once the bastion of Spanish and Hispanic culture in the entire country, once one of the most powerful and feared and venerated cities across Asia, once the terminus point of the Manila Acapulco Galleon train, and the birthplace of Manila itself, gone. And it wasn't just Intramuros, it was Tondo. It was Binondo, it's Malate and Ermita were totally wiped out. And beyond, and beyond those six cities, there's also damage that was caused in Quiapo, in San Palo, Santa Ana, Santa Cruz, and I think I said already said Paco, so enough about that, among other places. Okay, so the 60% was not just a random 60%, it wasn't a harmless 60%, it was the most important 60%. It was the seat of government, it was your old cultural enclaves, it was the living it was the living spaces of the rich and affluent, gone, destroyed. And it's one thing to mourn the loss of the architectural structures. The reason that Manila seems so hodgepodge is because we've lost our architectural identity personally, and that also has impact on the country. As much as I don't like saying this, Imperial Manila is called Imperial Manila for a reason. And because of the great influence of Manila to everything else. Again, with all due respect to the, those who from, from the other provinces, that is valid. It is unfortunately a valid reason. But beyond the architecture, you also have to focus on what was lost inside those buildings. They were churches and schools and libraries and museums.